Thank you. Thank you all for uh, coming today. I feel like the talks in the morning have prepared you well for this talk. One, there was a talk in English already, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and two, many of the talks were talking about how to match human perception with whatever it is you're trying to do with shape. So um, most of you know this, but it's easy to forget. Um, the first known computer vision problem is from 1966. It was proposed as a summer research project with two undergraduate students and one professor. So in three months, three people were going to completely solve computer vision. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, one of the reasons that um, that failed is that we completely underestimated how powerful our own visual systems are. So that totally looks like a woman dancing, <laughs> even though it is not. But we can all see that it is. OK, so um, I came to these problems uh, from math, as Professor Mora mentioned. And uh, the avenue that I came was one of approximation. So here's a thing that's been going around Twitter lately. Uh, we have something in the world, and we want to approximate it. <laughs> and you can do this better or worse. From a mathematical perspective, um, you often measure the quality of your approximation by some metric. And so I have definitely published papers saying this is a great shape model because look how well it approximates the shape in this metric. If you are a fluid dynamics person, that is a great way to approach this problem. But working in shape, that's missing completely the idea of human perception. So here are... This is a very old image, uh, but here are five shapes that are all very close to the center shape. In fact, depending on what metric you pick, each of them is very close or very far from the central shape. To us, looking at these shapes, uh, some of them are probably perceptually much closer, like A or D we typically will think are much closer than E or B. So, um, so what my talk is going to explore today is how to capture perceptual approximation. So this perceptual approximation requires shape understanding. So answering questions like how important is a feature to a shape? So both of these shapes have little round pieces stuck onto them. In one case, the round piece is very important. And in the other case, it's just a small bump. How do we handle things like occlusion? In metric approximation, these two shapes are very far apart. In perceptual occlusion uh, approximation, they are almost identical except for some occlusion. And then finally, uh, as a shape moves, as a, an animal moves its parts, for example, metrically the embedding into 3D of that shape is very different, but intrinsically the geometry is the same. So if we have this kind of shape understanding, this perceptual approximation pinned down, this can help us with tasks like matching between shapes, like tracking an animal through a video, 
um, and animation. In fact, this shape understanding has been formalized in 2013 by some graphics people in Europe who said that you truly understand a shape when you can decompose it into different parts. On each part, you have parameters so that you can move around on the part. And then you understand relationships between the parts. Which parts are more important than others? That's a parts hierarchy. Which parts are similar to others? That's parts similarity. And then the geometry of the parts. What do the parts actually look like geometrically? So just as in uh, metric approximation, in perceptual approximation, choosing the right representation can make all the difference. So you want to approximate a periodic function you should use the Fourier basis. <laughs> you want to approximate some piecewise linear function, you should not use the Fourier basis. So uh, if you found the sort of right representation for the class of objects, for me, this class is shapes, then uh, somehow you should be able to uh, get this perceptual approximation quite straight in a straightforward way. So, the, my argument today is that skeletal models are a good representation for shapes in order to get perceptual approximation. So why might this be? One is, so two very common shape representations are the boundary of the shape. So in 2D, this would be the curve describing the elephant or the interior of the shape. So the region in the plane that's inside the drawing of the elephant. Neither of these is really good for perceptual approximation. Why? Well, if you represent a shape by the region and you look at a point in the region and you look around it, it looks the same in all directions. You don't have a lot of information about what your shape looks like. If you take a point on the boundary and you look around it on the boundary, Again, you can have local information like, is my curvature large or small? But you don't have any sense of how that little local variation relates to the entire shape. So a skeletal model, one of the most common ones, is the Blum medial axis. It's obtained by blowing up maximal circles inside the shape and tracing out the centers of those circles. That gives these kind of branch-like pieces here. And you also store the radius of each circle. So here's the medial axis of the elephant. And now if I look around, if I take a point on the medial axis and I look around it, I both know how my part is curving. And from the radius information, I also know how fat it is, how skinny it is, if it's getting fatter, if it's getting skinnier. I suddenly have much more global information locally than other representations. Okay, so the one way to, under, to obtain the Blum medial axis is centers of these maximally inscribed circles. Another way to get it is more uh, variational approach where you set a fire on the boundary of the shape and is it playing? It is not playing. Please play. Uh, technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play it out here. So you set a fire at the boundary of the shape. And, oops, and now it's not mirroring this beautiful movie. Yes. <laughs> So you set a fire at the boundary of the shape, and as the flames burn in towards each other, they eventually meet. Where they meet traces out the skeleton, and the time to the meeting gives you the radius information. OK. Oh, it's, it's played. Oh, great. See, beautiful movie. There we are, <laughs> colliding. So I played this movie because there's a later movie that will hopefully play more easily, <laughs> uh, defining a different uh, situation. Okay, so this is um, our medial axis. And then amazingly, it has this, its discretization is 
probably the most studied discrete structure in computer science, the Voronoi diagram DLNA triangulation duality. So uh, super fast implementations, and there are theorems that show that as your boundary sampling becomes dense, the approximation provided by the centers of the circumcircles of the DLNA triangles slash the Voronoi vertices converges to the true medial axis. So has a good discretization. Um, it also has many beautiful mathematical properties. The medial axis is topologically equivalent to the boundary curve slash interior region of the shape. Uh, it takes something that's uh, two or three dimensions and reduces it to a sequence of pieces that are one dimension lower. Uh, you can prove theorems that it's efficient <laughs> Uh, in metric approximation, uh, if you want to compress your shape, the, the skeleton serves that purpose well. There are actually explicit formulas that take you from a closed form expression of the boundary curve to the medial axis and vice versa. So knowing one gives you complete information about the other. And then within each branch of the medial axis, the differentiability of the axis is the same as the boundary curve. And where it's not differentiable, where these branches meet, where you have singularities, these are completely understood. So generically, in two dimensions, you only have things that look like three branches coming together, the end. And things get a little more complicated when you have the two-dimensional medial axis of a three-dimensional shape. Uh, but then uh, those complications are also one of these six possibilities, the end. And looking at this, uh, you can see that if we want to understand parts, uh, these little skeleton branches seem promising for these tasks that we'd like to do. Uh, one challenge, so for example, if I want to track the motion of the cat's tail, that's probably going to be just one branch of the medial axis. And so I can track it image to image. One challenge is that though the tail might be one branch, other parts aren't corresponding exactly to a branch. So this leg has one, two, three, four, five, six. Six branches make up that leg. And there's no reason to know coming along here that really I want to connect this branch and not that branch to continue that part of the leg. So we need a way to understand how to stitch branches together so that a branch becomes a part or a sequence of branches becomes a part. The second challenge is that many of the shapes that we're interested in come out of digital image is, and have a lot of pixelation. And for every little pixelation bump on the boundary, you're going to get a branch of the medial axis trying to say, hey, look, there's a small part here. <laughs> uh, I will give you a branch for it. And so you end up with highly complicated structures that where most of the branches aren't describing things that you actually care about. OK, so today I'm going to propose some solutions. Uh, we're going to figure out a way to connect branches across junctions to find parts. We're going to figure out which branches are meaningful and which ones are just noise. And we're going to figure out a way to relate the medial axis to boundary information so that we can get this uh, perceptual understanding of our shape. Now we're going to do this by defining specific functions on the skeleton itself. So uh, first function is the extended distance function, which stopped playing for some reason. There we go. OK, so if you light a fire at each end point corresponding to a point on the boundary of the shape and then burn along the medial axis, things burn until they confront each other and then finally burn out. So this, the people who invented it originally called it the extended distance function, and then they changed the name to the burn time. And so I'm using both, and I'm sorry, it's not my fault. <laughs> but, uh, but you can see here that this 
this extended distance function is giving a kind of depth-based measure for pieces of the shape uh, as defined on the medial axis. So shapes that are, so parts of the shape that correspond to, uh, sorry, parts of the medial axis that correspond to shape parts that are not very deep are blue and the deepest ones are red. So, um, so the radius uh, of these maximally inscribed circles gives us a width of each point on the medial axis and this burn time EDF gives us a depth kind of measure on the medial axis. Um, did I want to say more about that? Not yet. Okay, so the drawback of a depth-based measure is that long skinny parts can kind of pull, pull the heart of the shape into them. So we'd really like the deepest part of the shape to kind of correspond to the center of the shape. And here you can see that whereas I think of the center of the shape as being at the middle of the diamond, the EDF has been pulled, the maximum value has been pulled out by the tail. So Professor Morin and her um, colleagues proposed an alternative to this EDF burn time, sort of a length-based depth. And their alternative was instead to look at a volumetric depth. So now depth in the shape is me measured by how much area or how much volume is taken up along the medial axis instead of just how deep it is. So you can see here that the primary path through the shape defined by the EDF gets pulled into the tail, but with this area volume measure, it stays in the sort of what we would think of as the main part of the shape. And sure enough, with the WEDF, the maximum value for this ray picture is in the center of the main part of the shape where we would want it to be. So these functions also have nice mathematical properties. They're finite except for the maximally closed subcomplex. So you take the kind of smallest group of holes <laughs> connected to each other that you can, and then it will be infinite there. It's monotonically decreasing as you move towards the outside of the shape. So you kind of have an orientation anywhere in the shape. You know if you're moving deeper into the shape or shallow, more shallowly into the shape. Uh, it's continuous within branches. And most importantly for us, it's continuous across branches that have already burned. So uh, this is the picture of the burn time that I played the movie of. And you can see that this branch burns away first. And this brand, these two branches, the EDF just kind of keeps on going across this branch point. And this tells us that if we want to concatenate branches to make a part, the way the direction of concatenation should be this way and not that way because we can follow the continuity. So applying this to this simple mouse shape, uh, you see that three branches have been glued together to form the center red part of the shape. You can see two branches have been glued together to make this foot with a less important branch stuck on as the heel, um, etc. So this helps us take the skeleton that was only partially informative before and put it together into parts. So using this parts set, we can uh, create a hierarchy. We can figure out what's the core of the shape and what are the parts of the shape. And then for the parts of the shape, we can figure out which ones are more important. So here, any part that starts in green is the same level of importance to the shape. It's at the same parts hierarchy. So the trunk and the front legs and the back legs all have the same depth uh, in terms of the WEDF value of those parts. And you can step all the way down to the bottom level. The least important parts are the pink things uh, and so on. And then because um, sometimes 
we aren't guaranteed to get, so if my hand is like this, I'm, I would get a branch here and a branch here. But if my hand is like this, I'll just get one branch. We want to be able to compare parts to each other in the shape. So we can take all levels of the hierarchy corresponding to these concatenated branches and subdivide existing branches so we can compare them. So now even though, um, so over here, the color's not great, but uh, so this red level is this blue leg. So now we can say which part of this part corresponds to that red level, which part of this is the red level, which part of this. So we know that we can compare all of the ankles of the elephant to each other. OK, so all these pictures are in 2D. Uh, but this can also be defined, at least in the discrete setting, in 3D. So again, you just light a fire along the shape. The fire runs along the medial axis. There are points of discontinuity here, and then points of continuity uh, there. So this kind of tells you, again, which subparts of the skeletal structure uh, should be joined together and which ones are, are less important. And on this, we can define a 3D version of the weighted exist, uh, extended distance function and uh, come up with a parts hierarchy uh, in 3D as well. So here's a parts hierarchy where the red piece is the core of the horse, the legs are in blue, the tail is in blue. And this is work with Thibaut Blancpain, who probably presented at this conference a couple of, but like two years ago, yeah. Yeah, and so you can see uh, a few examples of parts that are thought to be at the same hierarchy um, and a bunch of 3D shapes. And once we have this, we can do these, one of the things that we want to do, which is tracking hierarchy of parts um, across moving objects, like the bird flapping its wings. Uh, okay. Um, so I talked a lot about perceptual approximation, and then I went into a long digression about skeletons and their lovely math properties. But really, we need to come back to perception. So how do we measure human perception? It's pretty hard to do. So uh, we made a giant user study. So we took the MPEG-7 database of 2D shapes. There are 70 classes with 1,400 shapes. And we put it as an item in the greatest international scavenger hunt, greatest international scavenger hunt the world has ever seen. Gish was. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we had 2,000 annotators from across the world, all different ages, many different language groups. We had over 40,000 shapes that were annotated, and so that gave us about 24 annotations per shape. And so, from, so what the users were asked to do is take one of these shapes, tell us what the main core of the shape was, tell us what the parts were, and then tell us what details were. So that's like a parts hierarchy with three levels. Main part, main center, high level parts, and then details. And we took our parts hierarchy and uh, converted it to three levels. So the top row here is a bunch of our hierarchy annotations. And the bottom row is um, a majority vote, which I'll say a little bit about in a second, of the user annotations. And what we measured um, agreement between these two by looking at the, the proportion of the pixels inside the shape that were, that where there was agreement between our hierarchy and the user hierarchy. Uh, so we found that the median similarity was 80%. The average was about 77%. And just to give you a sense of how that's very much in line with what the users were agreeing with themselves. Here are two horses, both annotated by humans, and um, their similarity is 75%. So both really believable annotations, 75% similarity. 
Okay, so how, since the users aren't agreeing, uh, how are we coming up with one representative of the user study to compare with? Well, here are a bunch of bats and a bunch of different user annotations. And we just, for each pixel in the image, looked at the majority vote of the users for that pixel and annotated it. So this collection of bats produces this majority vote bat where the core is most of the wings. The details are these little nubs and there's only one part that's the head. So this is work with, among other people, Axel Tarlier, who's here. Um, it's a super interesting data set. So here is a shape that doesn't have any sense, like there aren't arms or legs. And here are a bunch of user annotations of this shape. If you take the majority vote shape uh, uh, annotation, you end up with everything being the core of the shape. But if you allow there to be two modes, you get uh, one that's quite interesting and quite different from the majority vote. So this is my advertisement. This data set exists online. There are lots of interesting questions that we have not asked or answered, and you should. So this is your next project. <laughs> OK, so um, back to things we want to do. Uh, so I talked about tracking the parts hierarchy in the flying bird. Another thing we want to be able to do is match. So we want to know when parts are similar. So there are two more functions that we can define on the medial axis. One is called erosion thickness, and one is called shape tubularity. So erosion thickness is the burn time, so like the depth measure that I talked about earlier, minus the width measure, which is the radius. And so it's giving you a sense of like the blobbiness of the shape. The shape tubularity is a ratio of the burn time, um, of the erosion thickness to the burn time. So it's kind of measuring the tubiness of a shape. So you can see here that um, the tuby part of the rectangle has really high <coughs> tubiness values, shape tubularity values, uh, but not very high erosion thickness very, um, values. So the erosion thickness and the shape tubularity are sort of measuring blobbiness and tubiness of a shape region. And uh, just to give you a sense on a more interesting shape. You can see that the shape tubularity is really picking up the tubiness of the dog legs of the dog tail. And we showed that up to articulation of a shape part, the values of the ET and the ST uniquely determine the geometry of that shape part. So the tail can wag, and as long as there isn't stretching or shrinking, the ET and the ST will be stable. So this lets us compare an arm like this with an arm like this. And if you take these values and on a sh given shape and ask yourself which parts are similar, uh, you end up with sequences like this. So parts that are painted in the same rainbow of colors, our algorithm thinks are similar. So the legs are similar to each other. All the kind of bumpy things are similar to each other. The trunk is not similar to anybody, and the tail is not similar to anybody, which matches reasonably well with our perception. To dig down a little more, here's a horse shape. Um, each of these uh, example horses is a different set of parts that our algorithm thinks are similar. Uh, and then at the bottom, combining them all to get this kind of painted sequence where we can match similarity. And it works on a bunch of different kinds of shapes, artificial shapes, real shapes. The camel bumps and the camel head we think are similar, things like that. So um, I set out to talk about perceptual approximation along the way to find shape understanding. And so I just want to pause now and point out that this has given us a shape understanding. We now have, uh, we understand our shape decomposed into parts by joining these branches together. We have parameters on the parts for free because of the skeletal model. The medial axis has parameters to move along. We have all the relationships between the parts, hierarchy, similarity, and we get geometry 
for free again from the medial axis. Uh, so, um, one more kind of sidebar comment. These measures of similarity can also be used to measure dissimilarity. So, uh, this is um, an extracted uh, corpus callosum from, these are both extracted corpora callosa from a lateral view of the brain. The, it's understood by doctors that uh, in schizophrenic patients, one end of the corpus callosum gets kind of blobbier, whereas in healthy patients, it's tubier. And so using this shape tubularity measure, this is a heat map, you can see shape tubularity is picking up a, a lack of tubiness in the schizophrenic corpus callosum and a high tubiness in the healthy corpus callosum. And in fact, I don't know if you can see the colors. These dots are red, these dots are green. This axis is the shape tubularity measure. You can drive a truck between the schizophrenic and the healthy values there. That is how well separated these are. So similarity is great, but difference is also great. Um, okay, so now let's come back to our question at hand, perceptual approximation, and consider this image again in light of the tools we've just heard about. So E and the center image and B and the center image shape can be very easily compared. Their core will be the same. Maybe the first level of parts will be the same. But then B will have a bunch of details that, a did, that the center one doesn't have. And E will have a bunch of details. And we'll be able to say that the details of E and the details of B are not the same because the shape tubularity and the erosion thickness values will be quite different on those parts. Same with C. We can understand that C and D will have very similar parts structures, but the blobby tubiness of the center shape will be quite different from these very pointy corners on C. Um, okay, so I've hopefully convinced you that um, the medial axis can help us with shape understanding and that shape understanding can help us with perceptual approximation. Now I'll show you one last project that brings these both together. This is with Bastian Dorix, who probably presented last year. I don't know. He'll be here Friday. <laughs> um, so this is coming up with a skeleton, a baseline skeleton that uses what we learned from all of that previous work to uh, come up with a skeletal model that has both perceptual approximation qualities and uh, metric approximation guarantees. So um, the lesson, a lesson of all the previous work is that um, a part corresponds to a branch or a set of branches. And so instead of removing parts of branches, if you want to remove a part of your object, you should remove the whole branch, or you should remove the whole sequence of branches that corresponds to that part. And so instead of removing little chunks of branches, we're going to go through and think about uh, the same kind of philosophy as the WEDF gives us about which of these branches corresponds to an important part, which ones do not, and get rid of the branches that are not important to us. In fact, we're not even going to compute them to begin with. So that's not how the algorithm works. The algorithm works by taking a circle and kind of rolling it through the medial axis and whenever it comes to a branch point, it says, if I don't generate the next branch, how much of the boundary shape will I lose? And here's where the metric approximation comes in. We will keep the branch if that boundary is within epsilon, Hausdorff distance of the resulting shape. So we remove the branch if the boundary change is not within epsilon of the original uh, brand, uh, boundary. And so you can see other methods that allow the rem partial removal of branches uh, remove perceptually important regions of the shape. So a uh, common method for pruning the medial axis is the SAT method. And you can see in red 
hopefully you can see in red highlighted regions of the shape that are not reconstructed by the SAT approximation. And you can see below that um, our skeletons are, are keeping all of that. And we're almost done with 2D. So you can see here's an, here's a, an unclean medial axis. You can see a lot of little noisy spikes that have been removed over here. So our last job is to go around the boundaries of these medial sheets and remove these spikes. And hopefully that will happen this month while I'm here. And then this will be published next year. So uh, that's the plan. I'll stop there and just say thank you to many of my amazing collaborators who are here. Today. Can you say that more loudly? The clean medial axis? The clean medial axis is super fast. The other stuff I mostly programmed, and so it's not. <laughs> yeah. But it's not that, like, it doesn't take hours and hours. It takes maybe maybe 30 minutes to run through the entire MPEG-7 database. So, and that's in MATLAB, so, you know, just to give you a, it could be much, much better. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah? Yeah, so this is actually ongoing work where, um, so neural networks are getting better and better at segmenting image, like there's MASK, RCNN, things like this. Um, a current project is to have kind of a U-shaped network that's training both the skeleton and the segmentation simultaneously. And so, so the hard part to, to sort of get at what's under your question, the hard thing is taking an image, extracting the shapes of the objects. Once you have the shape of the object, you can compute the skeleton quite easily, but that first step is more difficult. So, yes. So it's pretty easy if you, if you have multiple images if you have if you have multiple regions that you can say are distinct it's fairly easy to pull them out one at a time but when they are overlapping like you have a person sitting on a bicycle and it all gets blurred together uh, that's so it will be more you know I don't see a way where you at the moment where you could get a person get a bicycle but you could get the skeletal parts of the bicycle and the skeletal parts of the person and do partial matchings on parts and perhaps conclude this is a person sitting on a bicycle. Yeah. Um, so the short answer is no, because I think this will be a hard problem. But the long answer is that I hope yes. Um, so there's a lot of research that shows that both humans and pigeons, for example, kind of innately understand the skeleton. So if you ask people to tap in a shape on an iPad, they'll tap out along the medial axis of the shape. 
and they'll tap on it kind of in the same parts hierarchy that our WEDF gives. Same with pigeons. If you hide food in a shape and ask pigeons to go searching for the food, they will tap along them. They will tap their beaks along the medial axis, <laughs> looking for, and then go out to the sides looking for the food. Um, so. Uh, it's possible that there's something um, powerful in the skeletal model that in a conversation between appearance, segmentation, and skeletonization could help you infer better segmentations. But that would, you know, that's, in my mind, that's like a 10-year research project, so. But if you want to work on it, <laughs> come talk to me. <laughs> yeah. So the medial axis gives you a kind of graph representation. Yeah, like uh, for, some, for example, if we have a body and we have the skeleton of the body, so uh, we can, uh, if in the plane the body can move and we can have the occlusion and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So in your case, if we can use your method to do the, to have the skeleton and after that, uh, do you think we, is it a good step to do uh, before doing the graph representation later? I don't know enough about what you have in mind to answer that yeah. question, but come talk to me after and you can tell me what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah thanks. Can you perform statistics on your uh, medial axis shapes? What kind of tool would you need? Uh, to cluster, average, and medium type calculations? Because that would be extremely interesting yeah so it depends on I mean I think it depends so I haven't done this if I were to do it I might start with a simple representation so instead of the full geometry of the medial axis have a graph for example where edges are weighted by the length of that branch and maybe curvature of the you know like apply like make a simple graph structure do the statistics on the graph structure where the geometric qualities of the medial axis are stored as features on the graph. That might be where I would start. I don't know, what do you think? Uh, probably using some, uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you have a simple topology, then it's a tree. And yes. You could probably use some, uh, uh, some tree statistics that have been developed in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, so. At least in 2D. Everything, yeah. <laughs> Well, so in 3D, in 3D, once, so I didn't talk about this, but in 3D, the discrete setting, uh, compute, um, having a well-defined burn time is much easier in the discrete setting than it is in the continuous setting. Once you have that, however, there's a way to represent most of the medial axis as a graph. And if your shape is simply connected, that graph would be a tree. Can you apply this method on 3D models, uh, uh, burning from the surface of the model, and what kind of uh, curvature can you get? Uh, so, if I understood your question correctly, this is Thibault's work. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Uh, because this is discrete, we have the discrete burn time, we can extract this 1D skeleton. On the 1D skeleton, we can define the WEDF, uh, and then we can do this parts hierarchy. Once we have the continuous theory worked out, that's with another one of my collaborators, we are going to define the WEDF on the full medial axis, not just on the 1D skeleton. And then uh, I think we can do more things. Right, Geraldine? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, would, it, would it be possible to figure the skeleton and start, uh, the first, uh, start from uh, the uh, 3D shape or uh, 
Mm. Yes, people people do this. Yeah. Um, so by changing the radius, there are rules about what radius functions are allowed on which skeletons, but moving inside that allowable range, you can make things fatter or skinnier or wobblier. By changing the geometry of the branch itself, you can curve things around. By increasing the length, you can pull things to be longer, things like that. Okay, so that's the instruction again. Thank you.